Hello everyone, we continue our lecture series on introduction to genomics. This time we will be speaking about genomic metrics and recombination. Both of these aspects are coming up fairly often, so we need to be clear what they are and how they fit into the big picture. Before we move forward, there is a short summary from the previous lectures. So we talked about SNP markers and the fact that they are widely used and currently the most important marker types, that there are various ways how to express the genotypes of these biallelic SNPs that are on the so-called SNP chips. These SNP chips are of different densities that were created for different species and cover the entire genome. One of the key features of these SNPs, what we often mention, that we know their location. In other words, we have a map file available. So here I would like to talk just a little bit more on these metrics and maps that are associated with SNP positions. So in general, we have two kinds of maps. And so the one is the physical map that uses base pairs and the other one is the genetic map uses Morgans. Out of these two, the physical map is the one that is more straightforward and also that is more often used. So it is nothing else than the length of the DNA counted in the base pairs. So if this would be the start of the chromosome, this would be position number one, two, three, four, five, etc. So if we would have a SNP, for example, here, we could actually count which base pair position it is. Also, this is how the SNPs are being referred to in map files that you could see all around the channel. So this, we use uh, base pair positions there. Of course, sometimes we want to refer to larger distances or we don't need so much of a precision of a single base pairs. So then we refer to these distances in kilo base pairs. So kilo, kilo base pair is one kilo base pair is thousand base pairs. Similarly, we have mega base pairs that are one million base pairs. Here, I would mention something to the abbreviation. So the base pair is abbreviated BP, but the kilo base pairs and mega base pairs only KB and MB. Sometimes you see also the P appearing here. So this KBP or MBP, but this is less common. Also, when we refer to these larger or longer distances, we usually drop the pairs. So basically just, we just refer to this as mega basis or kilo basis. Also here is a bit of a conversion. So if we refer to the length of the mammalian genome, with an approximation of 3 billion base pairs. So this would be the 3 billion base pairs. That is 3 million kilobases, 3,000 megabases, and 3 gigabases. So this is also just gives one of the conversion possibilities or just visualizes how the conversion could be made. Of course, in other species that are not mammals, this could be also widely different. Now the other measure for the genetic length that is sometimes used is the so-called the Morgans. It is, at least from my perspective, a bit more a cryptic measure, but it's actually defined that in chromosome length of one Morgan, we expect one recombination. So in other words, for a chromosome segment of length of one Morgan, we expect one crossing over in one meiosis. The abbreviation for Morgans is capital M, and very often the smaller segments of Morgans that are used are so-called centimorgans. In here, 100 centimorgans is one Morgan. Now we could convert between these two metrics, the physical length and the genetic length. So from base pairs to Morgans in the following way. Let's say that the rule of a thumb for mammals is that they have a physical length of genome 3000 megabases. As for the genetic length in mammals, again, as a rule of a thumb, we would expect 30 recombinations. So the genetic length is 30 morgans, so this equals 3000 centimorgans. So from here, the math is easy. So one centimorgan refers to approximately one megabase, that is approximately 1% of recombination chance. While these approximations of one centimorgan equals one megabase is used fairly often in the literature, I want to underline it here that this is an approximation and this is a rule of a thumb. So in different species, one centimorgan can be equal to more or less of a physical distance than one megabase. 
also what this means is that uh, we expect one recombination in one meiosis every 100 megabases. This also means that if a chromosome is, for example, 350 megabases long, we expect three and a half recombinations on this chromosome on average. Of course, we do not have half recombinations, and this three and a half recombinations is really just an average because sometimes we could observe zero, one, two, three, four, five, six recombinations. So it's always a whole number, but it can, of course, vary. But if we would look at the population and the chromosome of this length, we would expect this number of recombinations to occur. We have talked about recombinations already a lot, so perhaps it is a time to explain what are these exactly. So recombinations happen when pieces of DNA are broken and joined again, producing new combinations. They actually create variability on the genomic level. During meiosis, the maternal and paternal chromosomes align, the arms overlap, temporarily fuse, creating a so-called crossing over. As a result, we observe exchange of genetic material between paternal and maternal chromosomes, so the offspring has different combinations of alleles than their parents. This is the same thing in graphical perspective. Let's say that the top chromosome here is the maternal one and the bottom is the paternal one, and we see that there are different alleles in the different sides, and if there is a recombination event happening somewhere, so the initial haplotypes of capital A, capital D, and capital C, and the lowercase variants are not valid anymore for the offspring because the offspring has a recombined haplotype of capital A, small b, and small c. Just a few short notes. So two loci recombine if between them an odd number of crossing overs takes place. These crossing overs are usually not observable but we also need to underline that these crossing overs are not an accident in the meiosis, but really they are one of the key genetic mechanisms to generate and maintain variability. We will mention the recombinations fairly often in the following videos when describing the various methods and the various ways how we could analyze genomic data. So it is very important to be clear with this concept right at the beginning. Again, here a more elaborate picture. So this is the flow of the meiosis. So we have the various phases and you see that at some point the maternal and paternal chromosomes recombine as indicated here by different colors and the daughter nuclei have a very different or can have a very different setup compared to the maternal and paternal chromosomes. So we would refer to these kind of changes later on in the lecture series. Of course, we don't know where these recombinations happen. In this case, there was one recombination per meiosis, but of course there can be more recombinations as well. And also these recombinations accumulate. For example, there are two generations difference between the individual and its grandparent. So two meiosis happened between the grandparental generations and the generations of the individuals on the current generation. So then we also expect more recombination events to happen. These will be really important later on when explaining the theoretical background of various genomic analysis methods. For now, however, I would like to mention a few more aspects of recombinations because it might seem that is a fairly straightforward matter that there is a certain number of recombinations uh, per meiosis and that's it but it is not that simple recombination is actually a very fascinating subject the recombinations and also the frequency of the recombinations seem to be governed by genetics and for example the recombination activity on the homogametic sex, so this is females in mammals or males in birds, so basically any individuals that have the sex chromosomes XX is increased. So we see more recombination in females, for example, in humans than in males. This recombination activity is about two to one, so we could observe 
double the amount of the recombinations in females real compared to, to males. Also, in general, the recombination activity varies along the genome. So there are places on the genome that we see many more recombinations than we would expect. So these are so-called recombination hotspots. And also there are parts of the genome where we don't observe so many recombinations. So these are the so-called recombination cold spots. Also, there seem to be a whole lot of other genetic regulation mechanisms for recombinations. There could be family differences or the recombinations could be influenced by selection. Also, one of the major factors is domestication. And for some reason, it seems that we observe much more recombination in the domesticated animals, so in livestock, compared to their wild counterparts. Actually, this is not just in livestock, but for example, also when you compare dogs and wolves, for example. I mentioned that the recombination activity is usually the function of the length of the chromosome, but this is not always true. In chicken, for example, we have uh, these short chromosomes, so-called microchromosomes. And here we actually observe much more recombinations than we would expect by the length alone. So there is something special going on on these small chromosomes that increases the recombination activity by a large margin. As always, I want to wrap up this presentation by a short summary. So we spoke about different ways how to determine positions on the genome. Well, some are more straightforward than the others with the fiscal map in base pair positions being the one that is more often used. We also talked about recombination events and that these have major biological importance and they introduce variability and have major role in genomics. For today, we would end here. Let me know in the comments below how you like this lecture series so far or if you have any questions. Thank you for your time today and I wish you a very, very nice day.